Good morning. Welcome if you are here for the first time. A big welcome. My name is Des. I'm the lead pastor here. Um, a quick thing before we dive in, just because we're doing things a little different today. You've got to stay all through the end. You've really got to stay all through the end. Super great. Uh, let's dive in. Let's dive in. We're in this series right now. Uh, is it possible? He's looking at the seven miracles that Jesus performs that the Gospel of John records. There's 34 miracles in the four Gospels, but John highlights seven that Jesus performs, and they are seven miracles that are seven signs that point to who Jesus is. Jesus is not just a prophet. He is not even just the Son of God. Jesus is God. And these seven miracles point to his divinity and point to his identity in being God. And so the journey so far has had us this way. We started with Jesus turning water into wine. And then secondly, he then healed a royal official's son, and he's not even there when that healing takes place. And then he heals an invalid, not a paralyzed guy, go back and listen to that one, an invalid who was by the pool, Jesus heals him, and he didn't even ask for healing. And then last week, we had the one which we're really familiar with, which is when Jesus feeds the multitudes, as we know, 5,000 men plus are all there. And the main point of last week's message, I'm going to remind you of, one, for accountability, two, because some of you heard something and didn't do anything about it, and three, to give praise because some people did hear the Lord speak to them, did act on it, have fed things back to me, and it's amazing. Like, it's amazing. So, last week I said this, let nothing be wasted. Time, your skill set, your talent, your abilities, your treasures, your stuff. Let nothing be wasted. That was really the heartbeat of last week's message, let nothing be wasted. Uh, how's that going? Are you still having that posture? Okay, Lord, like, speak to me. You heard me speak about it last week and the testimony that we shared in all of that. And as you do and act upon it, like, feed that back. Uh, I've heard some today people said, oh, this is what the Lord said to me and like, I stepped in and I couldn't, I can't believe the impact that's had. I'm like going, I can. I can believe the impact it's had. You hear his voice, you step in it, you walk in it. It's awesome. So, all right. Number five of seven. Number five. This one's different. It's really unique. It's not a group of people at a wedding. It's not a healing, a physical healing like the royal official's son. It's not this healing of guy who's been in that condition for 38 years. It's not that. It's not even a situation where there's these hungry people and Jesus just performs his provision and we have bellies full at the end. It's not that. This is a miracle that is just Jesus and his disciples. Nobody else. This doesn't involve a healing. It doesn't involve a provision. It doesn't really involve a huge amount except for Jesus just seems to be like showing off because he walks on water. That's the miracle. Walking on water is the miracle. Now, the Gospel of John is really interesting because this is in three out of the four Gospels. And I was tempted this week to go to this miracle in one of the other Gospels. And I went, no, there's a reason John records it this way. You see, the other Gospel writers have this account and have Peter trying to walk on water. But you see, John, and is inspired by the Lord in writing this Gospel, has a clear message Revealing who Jesus is. And the emphasis is on who Jesus is. Remember all this series. Don't seek miracles, seek Jesus. Don't just chase after miracles, chase after Jesus. That's the heartbeat. And John has this miracle story super short. It's almost like, one bullet point, one bullet point, one bullet point. Like there's no details necessarily, but there's enough to blow your mind. There's enough in it that may cause some of you to spontaneously combust today. 
That's how I felt writing it. I was like going, <gasps> when the Lord revealed something, you go, wow, that's incredible. Doesn't even need to involve a disciple getting out and trying to do what Jesus did. Just enough is written here that is amazing. So walking on water. Now, before I go to the text, which is in John 6, I'm not a scientific kind of a guy. And rarely do I want to dig into scientific research. But I was just curious. Because like this whole walking on water and I thought, I wonder if someone's thought, yeah, it's possible. You know, anybody could do it. Because we have water skiing and people even do barefoot stuff. So is that not it? You know, on top of the, and some of, you know, we, we have that, but I'm going, no, look at it, look at it. Apparently, it's, it is humanly impossible, but kind of is it. Let me just go there. Apparently, science has worked out that if you run fast enough, you can literally dance on the water if you run fast enough. If your foot speed's enough and you've got enough momentum, you can on top of the water. And I'm going, yeah, but it's not happened. And so the scientific research says this. If a human could run, and this is the speed they need to reach, could run at 67 miles per hour, then they think a human at 67 miles per hour with that foot speed would be able to dance on the water for a while. Now, you'll get into the miracle and see the distance you have to travel. So even that wipes it out. But 67 miles per hour, for your reference point, Usain Bolt, the fastest human recorded speed at top speed. Usain Bolt's top speed was just under 28 miles per hour. So if Usain Bolt can go a short distance, not even hitting 28 miles per hour, I think the 67 miles per hour number is not going to be there. And certainly not ever even close and not for long. Whereas we see that Jesus today has to go at least three miles. Are we good? It's a miracle. John 6. I'm going to read from verse 16 to 21. If you've got a Bible, open your Bibles in John 6 so you can see it on the text and maybe you can underline something, highlight something. If it's on your Bible app, you can do the same. It's on screen anyway for you to follow through. So are you ready? John 6, verse 16 to 21, that's it. And we're going to walk through all of it. I'll read it all in one chunk for starters. Let's go. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake. I'll briefly pause. It's the same evening as last week's message. He's just fed the 5,000. Okay? 10,000, 15,000. There's a lot. Okay? That's just happened. Same evening. So, when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set across the lake for Capernaum. By now, it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, some texts say three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. So you could think there's even a second miracle there because they got into the boat and zip, they got there. Anyway, super short. Not much info, but there is enough. Trust me, there's enough. Bit of background to help. This lake, Sea of Galilee, it's a lake, one of the largest in that region. It's about 13 miles by 7 point something miles wide. 13 miles this long. There's the lake, largest in that region. It lies 700 feet below sea level, surrounded by mountains. Therefore, when the winds come 
And because of its sea level nature and the winds and the mountains, storms do come up. And when they do come up, they can come up out of nowhere and can be quite aggressive. This is one particular night where all seem to be okay. They get in the boat, but out of nowhere, as we saw there in verse 18, the waters grew rough. We'll, we'll get into that. Just a bit of context to help with some pictorial images. The Sea of Galilee, when a storm does start to blow up, quite easily five-foot waves can occur. Five-foot swell. Up to 10 feet have been recorded as well. In small boats at that time, in the middle of the night, not good. But that's just to give you a sense of this. Jesus doesn't walk on water on some glassy pond. All right? There's the context. Okay, without diving into that too much. So here we go. So, verse 16 through 18. When evening came, the disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now, it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. Why not? Is this not a bit cruel? They've done all this. Okay, guys, you need to go to the other side. Off you go. I'm hanging back. Now, as we know, Jesus, when it's been big crowds, and he's been really involved in ministry, the whole thing, you often see this pattern. He would withdraw. He would withdraw. He goes up to a mountainside. He would withdraw. He needs to be replenished. Time with his father matters. It's not just go, 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 go. He knew that what mattered most was the condition of his heart, his intimacy with his father. This is not that unusual. But on this occasion, Jesus says, off you go, boys. But he's God. Off you go, boys. <laughs> There's a storm coming. Off you go, boys. Like Jesus reads the weather report and goes, huh, could be interesting. I don't, I don't, but off you go. So don't forget. Jesus says, go, they go. When Jesus says, go, it's always super easy and super calm, isn't it? Nothing ever just happens. What? Again, come on now. Out of nowhere, through no fault of their own, circumstances shifted. Out of nowhere, you could have had a great day yesterday and tomorrow could be uh, uh, all greater, I don't know. But out of nowhere, with no sense of warning, stuff just goes on and a bunch of things can happen. We'll go into that today, but here we are. Why did Jesus, don't forget it was dark, he hadn't joined them. Well, verse 14 and 15 of chapter 6, the end of that feeding of the 5,000 tells us a why. We'll go there briefly. So after the people saw the miraculous sign Jesus did, the feeding with five small barley loaves and two small fish and the leftovers, let nothing be wasted. How are you doing on that? So after he'd done that, they began to say, surely this is the prophet, the Messiah, who is to come into the world. Jesus knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. They weren't wrong in thinking he is the one. They weren't wrong in wanting him as king. But they were wrong in how they wanted that to come about. How many of you are telling God how to do stuff? Hey, God, if you could just do this, in this way. Just a little, just, we need a more surrendered posture. It's not that we can't go to God with details, but sometimes less is more in this. So there's the context. So it makes sense. He doesn't want the crowds following him. It makes sense. There's the why. But it says it was dark. The other narratives, gospel writers say in the fourth watch of the night. Roughly speaking, to keep it simple, realistically, it's about three in the morning. It's about 3 a.m., okay? So you know what that is, don't you? It's dark, dark. It's the middle of the night. Although for my wife, it's almost alarm time at 3.30, but moving on. 
3 a.m. It's dark, dark. Here we go. And the gospel want us to read it. John wants us to know it was dark. It's 3 a.m. And we know here they are stuck in the middle. This is a phrase that came to me this week that I think for many of you, this is the point. Stuck in the middle. They have been out on this lake way, 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 way longer than they anticipated because of the weather. This, there's no reason why they would still be out there. These are experienced. Some of them are fishermen. This isn't an unknown space and place. They are stuck in the middle. It's 3 a.m. It's dark. It, it's, there's no sunrise close by. They're far enough away, they can't go back, but they're not close enough to. They're stuck in the middle. And then it says in verse 18 that these strong winds come up and the water grew rough. I'll come to that. But there's the context. Now, before I get to verse 19 and 20, which are wow, just come with me a little bit. So I'm dwelling on this, I'm preparing for the message, I'm thinking, okay, here we go, the miracle is Jesus walking on water, there's the miracle, okay, well, what what are you revealing about yourself? Because that's the point. Well, he's revealing that he's, only God could do that, it kind of makes sense, it's supernatural, it defies the laws of nature, so there's the miracle, but I'm like, there's got to be more. You must be revealing, not just because that's not human, you're therefore God. There's always more. There's always a connection with God's story. He's always returning us back to his original intention. He's always doing things that reveal some greater purpose, even like the wedding at Cana and all his imagery along the way is key. And I'm like, what is it? What is it? And literally, like in my bones, I felt this need to go, Des, go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning. So I thought, okay, I'll go to the beginning of John. I'll go to the beginning of John. So I get to John chapter 1, listen to John chapter 1, in the context of what we're going to read, even so far, and in 19 and 21. John 1, verse 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. Through Him... All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. But the darkness has not understood it. I'm dwelling there. Now let's look at verse 19 and 20. Okay, when they had rowed three or three and a half miles, remember how wide this lake is? They're stuck in the middle. We can't turn back, it's just as far. But we're not, oh, the waters are there. When they had, like you can't make this up, can you? The genius of the Lord inspiring the gospel writer. Slow down reading your Bible. Hit the pause button. And then he says, when they had rowed, ah, it's a storm. It's the middle of the night. They've been out there for hours. They shouldn't have been out there for hours. It's evening time when they set off and the wind and the waves and they're basically on a treadmill but in the lake. It's all effort but we're going nowhere. And it's hard. And at times I'm sure they just stopped and went, we've got to recover. And they're gritty and they're trying and they're resilient and here we go and here we go. But they've got to be exhausted. And don't forget it's dark. Are we doing this? 
Do we? And, and it's there, and it's windy, and it's splashing, and it's coming in on the boat. The whole thing's taking place. But when they had rowed that far, stuck in the middle, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. The light of the world is appearing in the darkness and they didn't understand it. They were terrified. Some of you are stuck in the middle in something, someone pain, relationship, just life in general. There's just stuff. Some of you are in and the waves are there and the wind is there and you didn't invite it, but it's happening. Some of you are just gritting and you're going and you're getting tired and it's all there. And the reality is Jesus could be closer than you think. But everything around just got you so freaked out that even when something out of the ordinary is taking place, you're going, oh, now what? And so he's there, they were terrified, but he said to them, don't forget, it's chaotic. It's crazy out there. And Jesus, three and a half miles on the water, He's nearby. He's just nearby. He's not in the boat. We'll get to that. And he says, it is I. Do not be afraid. All scholars can see it. We've put it is I to make narrative sense for us reading it in the English. Jesus is saying, I am. I am. That's reserved for the name of God. I am. He's revealing to his disciples He's not just the Messiah. I am. And I am here. And I am with you. Do not be afraid. I know it's dark out here. I know these waves are here. I know you're tired. I know you're stuck in the middle. I am here. Do not be afraid. Trust me. I know, trust me. Now, if the miracle is walking on the water, though, what's that? We've got light in the darkness. And remember, I felt this, Des, go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning. Because I was like, go back to the beginning. <laughs> this is why I almost combusted. So I went to the beginning. The beginning, beginning. Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. Listen. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Another translation of that word formless is chaotic. There's no form. It's chaotic. It's chaos. Just no form. And it was empty. Darkness <laughs> was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Jesus comes in the darkness. This is the Trinity. Here we go. Father, Son, Holy Spirit right here. We see it. Jesus, sent by the Father. He's saying, say, yeah, but the Father and me, or we're all one. And in the beginning, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, we know the next verse says, and God said, let there be light. We, we like that, let there be light. If it was a literal Hebrew translation, the, the phrase would be, light be. That's all it means, light be. Jesus, just like the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, 
here comes Jesus to his disciples. God's intention all along throughout the scriptures is return his people to Eden. His intentions always be to return you back to his original intention. The word repent, repentance, teshuvah, is to return back to God's original intention. At the renewal of all things, palingenesia, Genesis again, our future, heaven on earth, the return to Eden is where we're all going again. That's all where we're at, yeah? And so he's revealing it. He's revealing it, all right? I agree, brother. So here is, just, and I'm going, this is why they're walking on waters in the New Testament. God's revealing his original intention. He is in control. He has all things underneath. And then Job chapter 9 verse 8. Job is scholars believe that Job was probably the original oldest form of scriptures that we have. One of the first books written. Job chapter 9 verse 8. Here we go. We're going to really explode now. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. Jesus isn't just walking on water because he sees his guys in trouble and goes, I'll go out there. He's not just some metaphoric lifeboat who'll get a rope and go, you're okay, boys. There's a reason that he's walking on the water because only God, only God is the one who treads on the waves of the sea. Only God, only God. And he's revealing it here. Is it possible that he is walking in the midst of your stuck in the middle situation and he's come out right alongside you? Is it possible that he's then saying to you, I am here, do not be afraid. Simple phrase from Jesus, it is I, do not be afraid. He said it to those guys and I'm saying it to you all this morning. Maybe it's real dark. Maybe it's real dark. I am here, do not be afraid. Maybe you're tired worn out, you've been trying your best to get through all of this, maybe you've been fasting and praying and more of this and more of this and you're just at the end and you can't think you can carry on and he's walked out right in the midst of your situation and said, it is I, do not be afraid. Maybe the wind and the storm is actually causing you to think, this is happening to me, what can I do? It's got louder, it's got more chaotic. Maybe it's a situation in your mental health, emotional health, a family issue, a friendship issue, a work issue, a health issue, a fear of the future issue, a national issue. These things are all blowing and blowing and blowing. And in the midst of that blowing, we can put our gloves on and start fighting and how are we gonna do it? But the reality is what we need is hear his voice saying, I am here, do not be afraid. We haven't finished, verse 21. In that context, verse 21 says this, then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Ha! Jesus doesn't come walking on the water and then Hey, boys, I'm in the boat with you. He doesn't. God will never impose himself into you. He will never make, you can't make anybody love you. You can't make it. You can't make anybody love you. But he goes, and he's right there, and they hear his words. The I am says, Don't be afraid. And then John writes this, then they were willing to take him into the boat. All the situation, the darkness, the wind, the waves, the storms, the here we go, the fatigue, always taking place, but they still had to go, Jesus, please get in. 
Jesus, please get in. Jesus, please move from there and be with. Jesus, draw close. Draw near to God here. Jesus, draw. We get in. Hello, back to the beginning again. I was reading through all of John 1. Listen to these words in John 1 again, in this context of what we've just heard. Verse 12 and 13 of John chapter 1. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of, born not of natural descent, nor a human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. To all who received him, to those who believed in his name. The I am is here, boys. I am here. I am. I am. To those who received him, come in my boat. He gave the right to become children of God. I'm just going to say this, because this is something that, in the last few weeks is starting to really go deeper in my own world. The very presence of God dwelling in you changes everything. His presence changes everything. Dwelling. Men who came on Tuesday morning were every Tuesday morning. Remember, we're going to memorize Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And we're going to go to places that men do not go to. The very heart. You're all welcome, guys. Tuesday morning in the student building, 6 a.m. till 7. His presence changes everything. You could know about who Jesus is. Some of you, even today here right now, I have to go there with this statement and question. You may have a theological construct. You may have a good doctrine. You may have a clear understanding. You may have memorized a bunch of scriptures. You may have it all down. This is who Jesus is. This is what he did. He came. He loves me. He lived. He died. He has risen. My sins are paid for, all there. And yet all along, he stood alongside your boat, declaring it. And he's not in your dwelling place which is your heart, your very soul. He's there and in the storm, help! Calling out to Jesus, when are we willing for him to come and make his dwelling in us? Because that's what it's all about. And for some of you, I believe today when we come to our response time, that's your move. That's your move. Like, I see it, I understand it, and maybe until today you didn't, but like, oh. They were willing to let him in to the boat. that specific situation that is a storm or a darkness right now. Maybe it's a person and they've ticked you off and you're very unhappy with them. Unforgiveness, it's rage, it's a mess. The re there's a reason you want Jesus still on the water. You want him to fix a problem without him coming in and saying, so how can we be part of that? Uh. What do you mean let nothing be wasted? Let everybody else deal with the leftovers. All mine's mine. Jesus comes to them on the water and they were terrified. But that's the enemy. He wants to shout at you saying, no, 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 you don't want Jesus. You don't want Jesus dwelling in you. You, you, don't, you don't want that. You don't want to fully embrace and understand the identity you have as a child of God. <laughs> but to live in that posture is incredible. So today, stuck in the middle, Maybe there's a situation and it feels like darkness and you are longing for sunrise. You are desperate for sunrise. But it just seems so far away. 
Maybe some of you are in the midst of a boat and you're just grit and you're going and you're going and you're not quitting and that's all good and that's all good and you're longing for the shore to arrive but you're just going and Jesus wants to come in alongside you today and talk to you about that. Maybe you feel like you're against the wind and you didn't bring that on. Maybe these waves of two feet, three feet, four feet, five feet, and you can't even see, and it's crashing over, and you're feeling the effects of all of that, and you're not sleeping, and your fear level's gone up, and you're worrying, your anxiety for the future things, and it's all crashing all around you, and life feels chaotic and empty, but the Spirit of God is hovering. God himself comes walking on the water and he's alongside. So this is what we're going to do today. I decided to take a whole chunk of my message and just go, I could go more and more in the scriptures of water and how God reveals himself through all of this. And I could give you a lot more information and some of you go, oh, it's so good and that's so inspiring. But if we were to miss the real why Jesus did this, then we would miss it. And so what I'm going to do is, at confession time, this morning when I was dwelling in this super early, like 4 a.m. going through, I said, Holy Spirit, you're going to have to lead on this bit completely. I think you've all realized it doesn't take much for me to get excited, like get really animated. And I'm like, but the Lord wants to just draw close to you this morning. And we just need to listen and say, get in, get in. I mentioned it to you last week. My wife's discipling me at the moment a lot. I didn't invite it. But one of the things that I now find myself doing is morning and evening having these five to 10 minutes of surrender, trusting in Jesus. It's amazing when we just invite him in to dwell with us. It's amazing. So I'm gonna lead you now in a moment and we're gonna dwell, and there's gonna be space for you. I'm gonna pray, and I'm gonna read some verses from Psalm 62. I want your hands free, no note taking, no Bible open, there's nothing on screen. Maybe you're stuck in the middle, but here's what we're gonna do. And I want to lead you in a moment and everything about it. You just listen to my words and let me just lead you in this time together. And then when we've done our, that, then we'll have more prayer time and worship. But let's just dwell in his presence. Whatever posture you want, can be palms up like this, just can be ready, you can eyes open, eyes closed, whichever. And this is how I start my prayer, morning and evening, and then we'll go forward. King Jesus, I give everything and everyone to you. I give everything in my life and everyone in my life to you, Lord. Just go ahead and what are those things in your life right now when I say everything that you just know are a bit like being stuck in the middle, in the darkness. It can be as small as I give my concern for these classes that I've just started, Lord, and they seem overwhelming can be a relationship, a health issue, 
a future. But I give everything to you, Lord. And King Jesus, I give everyone to you, Lord. It's everyone in your life. And maybe the Lord's, there's, a, there's a, a person or some people's names to mind and just reveal them to the Lord here. This is it, Lord. I, I give this person to you. You don't have to get into the details of the why, but I give every one to you. King Jesus, your scriptures in Psalm 62 have words for us this morning that we want to hear and encounter. Psalm 62 in verse one. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from me. Holy Spirit, we invite you in to our very soul because we seek rest because it's in God alone. We now surrender the striving and the things that we are doing in the hope of finding rest. But our soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. Jesus, I thank you that you are my salvation, my forgiveness, my restoration, my redemption, my justification, my identity. I am a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. He who had no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So find rest, my soul. Verse five, find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. King Jesus, we know come upon the stormy waters and our hope comes from you so we say thank you and we invite you in we invite you in Jesus come in in the midst of my current storm he alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. Jesus, we say thank you that you are our rock and salvation and you are our fortress. But we now declare in the midst of where we are right now, Lord, I choose to place my feet upon the rock. And I declare that you are my fortress. Nothing and nobody will cause me to fall and be shaken with you as my fortress. Holy Spirit, in my inmost being, strengthen me with your power and your presence because you alone are my rock and my salvation. You alone are my fortress. I will not be shaken. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your hearts to him, 
for God is our refuge. Go ahead, friends. Pour out your heart to him. Pour out those specifics. Reach out to him and say, Lord, here, would you step in? I invite you in, Lord. As I pour out my heart, I make room for you. Come live in me. May your dwelling place be found in me, O Lord. I trust in you at all times. For God is my refuge. King Jesus, I give everything and everyone to you. I give everything and everyone to you, Lord. Amen. So, I want to encourage you day and night. Trust in him. Surrender to him. Day and night. Storms will rage, winds will blow, darkness comes, but he says, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus, get in, willingly get in, I invite you in. Why don't we invite all of our prayer partners, leaders, please come down now, be available. Some of you in this whole season of Is It Possible are are praying for a miracle and that's still good and you're seeking Jesus. Come for prayer. So this morning, today was a day where you want to go from I believe all the Jesus thing and I've been in church for my life and I see it and I accept it and I'm so grateful for your gift, God, but he's dwelling within you. Today's a day. Come forward. Let us pray for you for that. That's, that's, okay, here we go. Lean in. And some of you are thinking, yeah, but that might cost. Yeah. But is he good? He is good. He is good. So we're going to have a time of worship together. And in this time of worship, I want to give you the opportunity to come forward for prayer, to find some space and kneel, to stand, to sit, to keep praying, to keep praising. You you do know that this is the house of the Lord and where God's people praise, he makes his presence known. It says the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. You cannot follow Jesus on your own alone. It's always, you're, you're his bride, you're his body, You're his family, your brothers and sisters. You were always meant to be this. This is is critical. So there is something mysterious about being with his people and the Lord bringing strength. And so I'm gonna pray and then in that whole time, it's like a couple of times of worship and we're still not finished. Just really go there. And and the song today, I like you, you. We don't even probably need words on the screen. You know them that well. Just get your heart out in adoration. King Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We choose to declare now how good you are. How good you are. And how good you've been. We choose to declare your faithfulness. We choose to declare your promise. We choose to declare your grace and your mercy and your love that chases us. You love us so much. So we declare that, but we also, Lord, want to spend the time of, yes, trusting and receiving to those who received him to all who believed in his name. 
he gave the right to be called children of God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Sit, stand, kneel, dwell. See you Tuesday, men. Ladies.